Today, this video is being sponsored by Squarespace. From online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the one and all platform for building your brand and growing your online business. Today, guys, we're gonna be reviewing Adam's 2.0 pizza video. We've already reviewed his first one, and as I said in that video, I wanted to review the first one to see, to have that as a base so we can see the differences between the two. And today, we're gonna to see the difference. If you are new, welcome to the channel, guys. Hopefully, you do enjoy this video, and if you do, then be sure to share share, like, and subscribe down below as I do appreciate it greatly. And let's get started. This is an update of a video I posted a year ago about how I try to make New York style pizza in a home kitchen. I'm gonna show you how my technique has evolved over the last year and also try to explain things a little better than maybe I did the first time, including what this style of pizza actually is. Now guys, remember in his prior video, Adam said that he had been perfecting this recipe for the past 10 years already. So this is gonna be year 11 because this is another year of perfecting it. And for a home pizza, the last video was wasn't that bad. There are ways to improve it. So I'm curious to see, um, well, what changes he made. Yes, I normally make my pizza dough in a stand mixer, but I will never cook in a stand mixer on the internet again, because I don't want people to get the impression that they need something so expensive to make good food. You don't. All you need is a bowl, ideally a big bowl with a wide base. Now, I do agree that you don't have to have an expensive piece of equipment to be able to make some of the most basic things in the house. I mean, you don't have to buy a mixer and one of these mixers, a KitchenAid, now they cost quite a bit. So you don't have to purchase one, but they do have their purpose because if they didn't have their purpose, then people wouldn't be buying them. Neither would Adam. These days I start by putting in all my water, about two and a half cups of warm water, then some sugar, a tablespoon. Some people might say that's a lot. I don't think that it makes the dough taste sweet. It does, however, help the crust brown at home oven temperatures, which are gonna be lower than professional oven temperatures. That's our main challenge here. In goes a teaspoon of active dry yeast, mix that up and let it sit for five minutes. Give that yeast a chance to rehydrate and to eat some of the sugar in there and to be fruitful and multiply. This is called blooming and it is not necessary. The dough will rise regardless. The reason people do this is to check to see if their yeast is still alive. And guess what? This was dead. Look, no change. I've been working from this jar of yeast since my first pizza video a year ago and this yeast is no more. It has ceased to be. It's expired and gone to meet its maker. If you don't use a lot of yeast at home and it's just lying around in the kitchen, it is a good idea to check it before you use it every once in a while. And if you have to, you can freeze the yeast. This can extend the shelf life a little bit, but always check your yeast before using it because if you use dead yeast, you're not gonna get the same results. It has ceased to be. It's expired and gone to meet its maker. So let's try this again with fresh yeast. You wait a few minutes and then here's my favorite part. I am not speeding up this footage. This is real time. Adam is still using active dry yeast, but he's using a new batch of it because fresh yeast is a different yeast. Gonna put in some olive oil, maybe that's two tablespoons or something. Some pros don't use oil in their dough. Again, I think that it helps the crust brown in a home oven. Then in goes a tablespoon of salt. Some people say that will kill the yeast. That is a myth, as you shall plainly see. Certainly with enough salt and enough time, you will kill the yeast, but this will not. Yeast is a fungus. Now, if you add a lot of salt to the recipe, it will start to inhibit its growth. Also, if you put it in the fridge, it will start to slow the process of fermentation down because it is a living organism, so it will slow down the fermentation process. Now flour. I use bread flour, which has a higher protein content than all-purpose flour. You can use all-purpose, it just won't be quite as chewy and stretchy. There's even higher protein flours that you can buy on the internet, but this is in every American grocery store. I start with five cups, by volume. Sure, that's not an accurate way of measuring flour, but this is just a starting point. I'm going to add more flour by feel as we need. Whenever measuring flour, if you want to measure it accurately, you need to weigh it. Because if you just take your little cup and you scoop it into the flour, you can compact it enough to the point where you're adding, maybe not double, but you are adding more than what the recipe calls for. And on top of that, you're gonna be adding even more flour. So in the beginning, it is a good idea if you're not very comfortable with this recipe to actually weigh it before, because otherwise, if you do this now and you don't know, as I say, that you add another 100 grams to it, you won't know what the consistency should be. 
So it's just something to think about. I usually just bring that together with a spatula or something, then get my hand in there and knead. You can take it out and knead on the table, of course, but with a nice wide bowl like this, you can keep the mess entirely contained in the bowl. For everybody that's worked with flour, you know that it's not something that's very clean to work with. It gets everywhere. Especially when wearing a black chef jacket, it's not a good idea when working in pastry because, well, you can definitely see that you've been working with flour. White chef jackets are pretty good in pastry, but in any case, I I would recommend using the countertop to knead if it's going to be more of a drier recipe like this. If it's a wetter recipe, yeah, a bowl can help because then it can go everywhere, but you have more space on the countertop and in a bowl, it can be a little harder to work the dough. I'm just gathering it together and then pushing it down with the weight of my body behind my palm. When it gets so sticky that I can't really work with it, I'll sprinkle on a little bit more flour. As little as possible though. My question is this, why is there a need to add more flour to your dough when one, you haven't kneaded it enough, it's not worked enough, and two, if we look at all the flour that's still around the edge of the bowl, all of this is part of the measured amount that he added to this recipe. So if you don't scrape down the sides, you're not following the amount to the recipe and you're just adding more to it. So right now we don't know if we have exactly 500 grams or we have more. So when making a recipe like this, whether it's by hand or in the mixer, you need to scrape down the side of the bowl, mix all of this together before you start adding more flour or even if in some cases, more liquid to help make it a little wetter. I really prefer wetter doughs these days. They bake up lighter and crispier. The only downside is they're sticky and hard to work with. So I'm adding the minimal flour to keep it workable. The test to see if it's ready is to see if you can stretch out a patch of it really thin without it tearing. That is not ready yet. By the way, some pros would say if you're going to use oil in your dough, you should add it at this stage rather than at the beginning. They say you got to let the flour hydrate first before you introduce the fat. For all the pizza chefs out there, how much olive oil do you really add to your pizza dough? Do you add it to the beginning? Do you add it again after you've kneaded it? And do you add more at the end? Because from the last video, we know that Adam will add more to this recipe. He will soak the balls in olive oil when he puts them away. It's more and more and more product and it does add up. The problem with that is that it's hard to knead oil into a dough that's already gone smooth and elastic like this, especially when you're kneading by hand. I've done it both ways and I think the texture of the finished product is virtually indistinguishable. I just don't think it makes a big difference in a dough this lean. A few things happen to flour when you add water to it. The starch molecules in the flour expand and the gluten molecules will form long curly chains that bond with one another. So kneading, mixing, and resting can it help encourage these bonds to the dough, giving it that stretch and that springiness in what we call elasticity. Drier doughs are firmer and wetter doughs tend to be softer and sticky. All right, I've kneaded this for 10 minutes and now I can stretch it thin without it tearing. This is enough dough for four home oven sized pizzas. So I've got four containers here big enough for the dough balls to double in size. I'm pouring a little olive oil into each. More olive oil. Now, as we saw in the prior video, Adam is not doing a rise or a first rise with the dough, but with portioning the dough, you don't have to add that much olive oil. You can, if you want to use olive oil, you can lightly grease the pan or the tray. The other option is to also put a little flour down on the tray. So you can either go the wet method or the dryer method. Then you could use a scale to divide this into four equal balls, or you could do what I usually do these days, which is to tear the ball in half. <sighs> then heft each ball for weight. If one feels heavier, transfer some dough to the other ball. One of those goes back into the bowl, and then we do the same to this. Tear it in half, heft the balls for weight. Then it's time to shape them reasonably smooth and round. The shaping doesn't really matter so much with a wetter dough like this, because it's just gonna kinda go into the <sighs> container no matter what we do. For all the pizza chefs out there, do you you agree that the shape doesn't matter? First, I would recommend for anybody that hasn't made this before and that's not used to it to use a scale. Normally when you make a lot of pizza, and I'm speaking for the restaurants, I'm not speaking for the houses, the shape though does help when you put a lot of the dough balls into a tray together. If you do it correctly and you give them enough space, you will still see the creases between the dough balls and that way you can take a spatula and cut them out and more or less it will be exact. And what I like to do is use the ball like a paintbrush to oil the inside of the bowls. In the process, the balls themselves get good and covered in oil too. Very efficient system. Squarespace has the tools that you need to start your online business. 
including e-commerce, templates, SEO tools, a simple checkout process, and secure payments. So whatever you sell, Squarespace has the merchandising features to make your products look their best, which is much more important than you may think. And for creators or other chefs wanting to monetize their content, you can unlock new streams of revenue for your business. So be sure to check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash chef James to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain using code chef James Makinson. Thank you, Squarespace, for sponsoring this video. The oil helps to keep the balls from drying out, which is especially important if you're going to keep these in the fridge for up to a week, as I do. It also helps you get them out of the containers later, and the thick coating of oil on the surface again helps the crust brown at home oven temperatures, because oil is such an effective thermal interface. I have never heard this terminology before with cooking. Never. Olive oil is a medium. It helps to transfer heat to cook it. But a thermal interface, at least from what I know with tech, thermal interface materials are materials that are used to dissipate and improve the transfer of heat out of electronic devices. In other words, when building your PC, if you're using the thermal paste on your CPU and then you're putting the heat sink on top, the thermal paste is helping to disperse the heat to get rid of it from the CPU. Cover them up and then you could either rise them on the table for a couple hours and then bake them, or what I do is throw them straight into the fridge. Some people rise them at room temperature for a bit before refrigerating. I think that makes almost no difference. And this way you can just throw them in and forget about them. I make my dough when I'm not hungry. And then after at least 24 hours cold rise, these are ready and I can bake one super easily and quickly whenever I want. They're already portioned. It is good to have a little system down that you have everything prepped and it's already in the fridge so you know everything's set you just take it out and make it now as far as the first rise that doesn't make a difference at all i beg to differ the first rise gives the dough time to develop its gluten structure this is a continuation after kneading it and that gives the finished crust more of a chewy texture the second rise will allow the yeast to produce more gas which helps leaven the dough. And for those of you who are not very familiar with this word in English, because I have a lot of people that are not native English speakers watching, leaven bread, leaven means bread that has risen. Unleavened bread are flat bread. So these are like pita bread, tortillas, well, Latin American tortillas, not a Spanish tortilla. But in any case, any pastry chefs or any bakers watching, let me know your thoughts. Though I do think these basically get better as they age in the fridge up to a week. I have a whole video about that, which is linked in the description. Okay, time to bake. You need a hot surface to bake on, and I have recently switched from a stone to a steel. I have a video that systematically compares the two. It's also linked in the description. The steel is simply more thermally conductive. It would be too thermally conductive for a thousand degree wood fired oven, but for a home oven, it's perfect. I've recently started putting it on the second highest rack position. I find that's best for browning the top but every oven is different. Every oven is different and it is a good idea to know where the hot spots are in your ovens because not all of them cook the same and there are certain spots, especially after some time, that ovens tend to cook a little more in one spot than another. But it is interesting to see that Adam switched from a pizza stone to a steel plate. So he has changed quite a bit in this past year. You want to get your oven as hot as it goes, though. For me, that's 550 Fahrenheit on the convection roast setting. And I will preheat my steel for a full hour. You could do less, but this gets me a noticeably browner, crispier mm. crust. And electricity is absurdly cheap here in America. To be fair with Adam, this video was a few years ago, and this was before all the other prices right now. I know prices have gone up everywhere. I'm not sure how expensive they are where he lives, but at least where I live, electricity is super expensive. So in any case, times have changed a little bit. Um, so you may not want to heat your oven for an hour. Again, it depends on how much you want to spend, but you may not want to. Cheese. One of the things that makes this style of pizza different from, say, Neapolitan pizza is low moisture mozzarella. If you use fresh mozzarella, you can only use a little mm. bit of it. Otherwise, your pizza will become soaked in whey. That's why Neapolitan pizza only has splotches of cheese. New York pizza has a solid layer. Part skim low moisture mozz is very easy to find, but the whole milk version tastes a lot better and it's much harder mm. to find. I used to be able to get it molded into sticks. Galbani's 
string cheese. This was a pain to unwrap, but it was a good cheese. Now they only have the part skin kind at my store, so I'm struggling to find a replacement. I haven't tried this mozzarella before, so I don't know what it tastes like. For those of you who have, is it really a good cheese? There is this whole milk low moisture mozz from Walmart. It is not a great cheese, but it's the right <laughs> style. I will say beware of this cheese from Palio, which a lot of people like for pizza, but this cheese they sell retail is not what I would call a true low moisture cheese. It's basically medium moisture. Mm -hmm. Look how much smoother the Palio is compared to this Walmart cheese. Look at how much squishier it is. When I taste them, not only is the true low moisture cheese on the left noticeably drier, mm -hmm. it is also tangier, which is key. Palio does make a good whole milk low moisture cheese for pizza, but only in these big seven and a half pound loaves for commercial use. This is a different cheese from what you will find in the grocery case, though you might be able to get it at your deli counter. This is something I wouldn't expect because when buying, say, a large block of Tillamook cheese, normally the smaller block, if it's the same type, is the same cheese. But as we can see in the little corner now, we can also see that this is a craft food. So is it the same? Don't know. It's one pound. I tend to do about seven ounces on my pizzas, so this is a little more than what I need for two pizzas. And then crucially, I'm going to put it back in the fridge after I grate it. I have found that, in my oven at least, if I keep the cheese cold, it's less likely to overheat and squeeze out an orange grease layer before it's had the chance to brown in the oven. Certain types of cheese are better melting types of cheese than others. Mozzarella is considered a good melting cheese. It can separate on you or it can split, and this is what uh, Adam means by when the oil or the fat starts separating from the rest of the cheese. It can happen. And then it makes the pizza very greasy. Okay, now sauce. The New York style pizza that I'm talking about here is a street food. It's cheap. It's generally made with canned sauce products. A popular one with New York joints mm -hmm. is Full Red, which only comes in number 10 mm -hmm. cans for commercial use. That's almost mm -hmm. seven pounds of sauce. This right here, far and away, is the closest thing to that stuff that I can find in U.S. grocery stores. Pastine, kitchen-ready crushed tomatoes. Really good. It's very strong. I don't have to supplement it with tomato paste. I do put in a pinch of sugar, some dried oregano, and a lot of olive oil. Now this is a big difference because in the last video we saw Adam using San Marzano tomatoes and apparently he did not like those at all because he added tomato paste to it and he added a bunch of other things to it and the San Marzanos if you get the DLP or the destination of origin tomatoes these should be good tomatoes. It should be a good product. I love fresh oil in pizza sauce, but you do you. There's enough for like four or five homemade pizzas in a 28 ounce can. I've just mixed up enough sauce there for one pizza. The key thing is to not cook this sauce before it goes on the pizza. Canned foods are already cooked a little. Canning requires heat. If you cook your sauce any more than that, you're likely to lose the brightness that is key to this style. You end up with a flavor that reminds me more of lasagna than of pizza. The pizza sauce will start tasting like lasagna. Lasagna. There are a lot of things that contribute to making a lasagna, not just the sauce, but you have a lot of other components that contribute to the flavors. But cooking the tomato sauce will make it taste like a lasagna. For me, this seems like a bit of an um, interesting statement to make. Here is my pizza peel. You need something big and flat to shimmy the pizza out onto the steel. I used to do it with a sheet of cardboard back in college. Hmm. <laughs> you have to be resourceful sometimes in the kitchen, although it depends on the cardboard that you use. It's not the best option because there are chemicals and glues and everything that are on that cardboard and sometimes even ink. So. In any case, sometimes you have to use what you have to use. You need a granular matter to keep it from sticking, and I'm back oh. to using cornmeal. I know I said that I don't like the grittiness, but I don't know. It's traditional in my mind, and for some reason I just like that, even though I don't really like that. And this is because in the prior video, Adam specifically said he did not like this, so he was not going to be using it, and he used flour instead. Oh, he's changed quite a few things with this recipe. Now what I do is put a plate on there and then some flour on the plate. I pull the dough straight out of the fridge. I do not warm it up before I work with it. This is a very wet dough and the cold helps keep it workably stiff. I take it out while deflating it as little as possible and then get it coated in flour. I didn't used to do this step, but again, wet dough, gotta keep it from sticking. And yeah, I know how to toss pizzas in the air. I still prefer to just do the gravity stretch method. I just go around the edge forming the thick cornice while letting the rest of the dough fall and 
stretch out naturally. This is most significantly cleaner than tossing it in the air. I think it gives you a little more control and no, it does not give you a perfect circle like centrifugal force does, but guess what? I don't want a perfect circle. I want an oblong. A characteristic of New York style pizza is it's wide, wide enough that you can get foldable slices. And it's basically as thin as you can get it. In a home oven, I can bake a wider, <laughs> thinner pizza if I just let it be shaped like an oval. Yeah, this is not a perfectly shaped pizza, is it? But at home, it doesn't matter as much. And especially if you're not a perfectionist with it and you just want to make a pizza. If you do want to be a perfectionist, if you want to try to improve, and also if you are working professionally, then you need to put a little more effort into it to make it look a little more presentable than this. If you have very little skill in the kitchen, like very, 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 very little, you can use a rolling pin. It's not ideal, but you can. Or you can also try the slapping technique, which is another method. There are lots of ways. It's just that some ways are, say, a little easier, and other ways may be a little harder, but you get better results. Sauce goes on, smoothing it out with the back of a spoon. I generally feel that if I've put on a little less sauce than is my instinct to put on, then it's gonna taste perfect. You gotta remember how thin this is. For <sighs> flavor, I think it's key to sprinkle on a little grated Parmesan mm. under the Mott's layer. Some New York style places do this, others don't. I think it adds a lot. And you can still put more on top later if you want. Adam did this in the prior video as well, adding a little extra cheese on the bottom, but he did add more sauce to it. Then the Mott's. I find that if I start by sprinkling it around the edge first and then work my way in, that gives me the most even distribution. Again, if it feels like not quite enough to me, then it ends up being just right. Hmm, so for shaping the pizza, we're not gonna put that much effort into it, but for putting the cheese on top, this is something that we're going to put some effort into. Then very quickly, before this dough bonds to the wood, bring it over to the oven, a little shimmy just to make sure it's gonna release, and then shimmy it out onto the steel. A pizza this thin in an oven this hot cooks really fast, six or seven minutes. It's a game of chicken with the cheese. I wanna wait until I've got as much color as possible, but right before it starts to overheat and squeeze out its fat. Rather than taking the pizza out with the peel, I usually grab it with tongs and pull it straight out onto a cooling rack. Main reason I do this is so that I can be building the next pizza on the peel mm. while this is baking. <clears throat> but I also think this is a little cleaner, and I definitely like to rest the pizza on the rack. It keeps the crust crispy. And another tip in the kitchen that is a good one to actually live by is clean as you go. So you cleaning little by little as you're making everything. So when you have a little bit of time, instead of resting, um, playing with your phone, you do the dishes, and that way you don't have to do them at the end, and that way it just cuts down time overall. When it's cooled down a bit, it's solid enough to cut cleanly. I honestly don't think that pizza cutters are good tools for the home, because when you use them on a little home cutting board like this, they're likely to fall off the edge and hurt your table. For a pizza this size, a good old chef's knife is a perfectly adequate tool, and it's safer. It gives you more control. Now look at how brown the bottom is. You can even see some leopard spotting there, like they get in the wood-fired brick ovens. I've never achieved that with a pizza stone in a home oven, only with a steel. That's really tasty. It's the taste I grew up with, and if you make your dough in advance, it's a pretty easy weeknight family meal. So overall, the pizza does look good. If you're gonna be making this at home, it's fine. I mean, there are things that are not perfect, and I'll speak about that in a second, but it looks okay. If we are to compare this one, though, with the prior video, as well. It's very similar, the end product, and since we can't taste it, we can't taste the difference between the dough, the sauce, or the cheese, and Adam didn't explain the differences between the two when he was eating it, we can't necessarily tell. Whenever using flour, as I said earlier, it is very important to weigh the flour, because if you're using a spoon, you can compact the flour and actually use more than what the recipe calls for, and if you're doing that, then you're not following the recipe. You're adding more flour. And if you add even more flour, as we saw as well, the next time that you make it, you're not gonna have a standard. So in any case, guys, when making any recipe, I suggest that you follow the recipe. And if it does seem a little bit off, then you can make adjustments. For all the professionals that actually make pizza for a living, for all the pastry chefs and bakers that actually work with flour and dough all the time, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Hopefully you liked the video, guys. If you did learn something new or if it was a little bit interesting to be sure to share, like, and subscribe as it does help my channel out greatly and I do really appreciate it. And be sure to check out this video coming up right here and I will see you guys again very soon. Until next time, take care.